Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, being here at uh, this early hour. Um, delighted to have you here. Uh, I'm Lee Liberman Otis. I uh, am uh, uh, the director of the faculty division of the Federalist Society, as probably most of you know at this point. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome our two guests uh, here, uh, Eugene Volokh and uh, Randy Barnett. I am not going to inflict an introduction of them on you, given that I'm sure everybody is well aware of who they are. Um, I do want to say one thing, uh, uh, though, which is that I want to thank them especially, uh, one, for their help in putting this conference together, which they've been uh, doing along with John McGinnis um, and uh, Gail Harriet and uh, uh, Todd Henderson for, for quite a few years now. Um, and uh, 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 second, to thank both of them for uh, helping to fill in in a couple of uh, moderator slots where we lost our moderators to the weather, um, as well as uh, doing this, this panel. So thank you very much, Eugene and Randy. And over to Eugene. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much for having me. And thanks also very much for setting up this little panel. Um, so I uh, went into law teaching with all of 10 weeks of practice experience under my belt. Those were during the second summer of law school. I clerked for a couple of years, went straight into teaching. Uh, and uh, I always thought of myself as primarily a, somebody who writes about law, and that's still how I think of myself. But over the last several years, I suppose I've been bitten by the litigation bug. Uh, and the real question, I think, for those who want to be uh, both scholars and involved in, uh, uh, in uh, litigation is just how do you do it in a way that doesn't compromise your main duties, which are scholarship and teaching. Uh, and I think that I've hit on a way that is also reproducible in a wide variety of fields of putting all of this together, and I want to pass this along. Uh, this, uh, just this last fall, I uh, taught uh, in class that I've made up at the, the law school, which I call a First Amendment amicus brief clinic. And what we've done is we filed, uh, 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 or filed or are about to file, just the schedule being what it is, uh, 12 briefs, uh, amicus briefs in a wide range of First Amendment cases. O overwhelmingly free speech, although one of them was an establishment clause case. Um, and these briefs uh, uh, we filed in federal district court, we filed in U.S. Court of Appeals, we filed in the U.S. Supreme Court, we filed the, or are filing in a trial court in New Jersey, in uh, 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 the Intermediate Court of Appeals in Washington State, and the Supreme Court in Texas. So it covers a wide range of topics uh, within this particular area, wide range of courts. We filed them in uh, uh, merits cases and in discretionary review cases. I actually think amicus briefs are especially useful in discretionary review. Uh, uh, the, I've had 12 students working in these 12 briefs. What happens is I have them working in teams of three, and actually each one ends up writing a rough draft of, a, of the brief himself. Uh, and, then, um, and then they meet together and they, they, they pick and choose the best parts in a sense. Uh, and then it's very heavily edited, sometimes basically rewritten by me, but still. Uh, uh, they do a lot of work on these three briefs. They get four units of credit, I get four units of credit. Uh, and I think the results have been generally pretty good. Um, so that's the what. Now let me tell you about the why. The reason I think this is good is I think this is a five-fold win. This is win, 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 win. And that's for five different, different groups of people or organizations. Uh, first, for students. Uh, I do think that what people are telling us about how the students need more skills training, I think is absolutely right. I think they don't need just skills training. Uh, but I think they need a mix uh, of uh, substantive law, which, of course, teaches the skill of thinking like a lawyer, uh, and other skills. Now, in a sense, these are, very, these are skills that are not particularly exotic. I'm not saying this is, for example, a substitute for clinical education on other areas such as depositions or uh, an, uh, a negotiation and such, which actually I think is very important. It's an interesting question how you teach them well, but I think they're very important. This is much more traditional. This is legal writing. Uh, but that is a very important skill, and it's one that I think we don't teach as much as we ought to, uh, and for, for very good reasons. It's, it's very labor-intensive to teach. Nonetheless, it's something that I think if we can find a way uh, of teaching is good. 
So first of all, it teaches them to write better. It teaches them persuasive writing. Uh, and that's itself uh, an important skill. Uh, for, for, uh, um, uh, and it's important even to people who are, don't litigate, because you have to persuade people in a lot of, uh, a lot of areas. Uh, uh, you sometimes have to persuade your own client of something. Uh, it also teaches them what I might loosely call the rudiments of legal strategy, which is just maybe not even teaches them how to do legal strategy, but teaches them to start thinking about legal strategy. What is the role of this amicus brief? Uh, is it, uh, uh, is it uh, uh, trying to supplement uh, uh, kind of poor lawyering on, uh, uh, or compensate for poor lawyering on the part of, uh, uh, of uh, a lawyer? Is it just sort of a me too thing, which just signals that this is a left-right coalition? Uh, is it something where there's a particular message that this group who we're representing could be sending? And what is that? Uh, likewise, uh, in amicus brief, more than in a party brief, you can pick and choose what it is you're going to stress. Well, what is it that we're going to stress? What is the one main message you want to convey here? It's very basic stuff, and stuff that we as scholars, of course, always have to think about in our writing. Even our objective writing is persuasive. And there's a strategy to it, but uh, we forget how much students don't actually know about this. Uh, so I think it's, uh, uh, it's a very good training for them in such things. It's also training for them in working together in groups under the supervision of a supervisor uh, who is going to be very demanding and who's going to demand that they write in his style and the way that he likes, which not coincidentally is what they're going to be doing for many, many years in, in law firms. Uh, so I think, I think it's helpful for students. I think it is exciting for students. I think students love the idea of working on a real case, even in an amicus brief uh, uh, context. Um, and it is, uh, uh, and of course, they love the idea of working on kind of sexy areas of the law that probably when they're in practice, they're not going to get a chance to. Uh, I also think it helps not just my students in this class, but my students in other classes, in my substantive classes, because I think it makes me more credible as a teacher to them uh, when I can say, look, this is something we filed this brief on this particular issue we're about to discuss in class. And you know, we petitioned, uh, for, we supported a petition for review, and review was granted. And here's how we argue this. Uh, um, obviously, it's not a substitute for, uh, for uh, a law teaching. Uh, I'm, I know that uh, we, we often complain about some adjuncts basically turning their class into collection of war stories. But as with so many things, it's a, you won't need to find the right mix. And a little bit of war stories does make you a more credible teacher and helps make some of the points you try to make in your substantive class more vivid. Now, so that's why it's good for students. But let me tell you why I think, in particular, amicus briefs are a good teaching vehicle for this. One reason is scope. An amicus brief, as opposed to a party brief, can and probably should be about one thing. And you get to pick and choose that one thing. And with a party brief, there may be all sorts of procedural overlays and who knows what, state law questions, um, that uh, the students aren't really prepared to deal with and that you may not be that expert on. You could try to p pick it up, but it'll be actually quite burdensome for you to do that. Whereas if you were doing, I'm doing a First Amendment clinic, you might be doing a Fourth Amendment clinic, a bankruptcy law clinic, a who knows what clinic. Um, uh, and you can pick and choose the one issue that you actually know very, very well. And that the students you may have pre-screened to have taken this particular class, they know it well too. They can start out focusing on this one thing. Now, of course, ultimately when they're in practice, they're going to have to deal with bigger uh, uh, and less focused things. But, you know, baby steps. You, you, should practice, you should learn first on something focused and then, and then use that skill uh, later. Uh, for, for, for more, for, for bigger things. So there's a, there's a narrower focus. This means the briefs are somewhat shorter. So I think students can work on three in a semester and get four units rather than for a merits brief. Maybe that would be too much work. Uh, they are uh, also a good way to dip a toe in the ocean of responsibility. These are real cases with real clients, but those real clients will not go to jail if there is a problem with the brief. And of course, we want to make sure the briefs are all high quality. I like to think that every brief that we are uh, submitting is of high quality. But there is an extra level of responsibility and worry for the students and for you if you are actually representing a client whose property or liberty is at stake. And if you're representing an advocacy group, again, you should feel some responsibility, but it doesn't have to weigh on you as much. Another related advantage of amicus briefs is timing, uh, that uh, you can schedule the timing better because there's only one brief. As opposed, and it may, the litigation calendar is not the academic calendar. 
And that's always a problem, even for amicus briefs, but it's less of a problem here, whereas for, for party briefs, you might have an opening brief and a reply brief, and then it may have to be oral argument and such, uh, stretched out over a longish period of time. Uh, uh, so, uh, so the last advantage is, in some of these, for some of these briefs, even if you have good students, you're going to have to rewrite them from scratch, more or less. Uh, and with an amicus brief, you can do that, and you can often do that in the span of a several hours because it's in an area that you know, you know very well, and that's how you chose it. With a party brief, uh, you might not be able to because there are all these other issues, again, state law issues or, or who knows what, that, uh, uh, that might require a lot more work uh, for, for you to do. So that might make uh, uh, amicus briefs are more likely to be manageable for you as well. All right, so turning to why do it, why do it for our own purposes. I, I feel in this group we shouldn't... Uh, I, I don't see need to be bashful about recognizing that we are rational actors and that we're going to undertake extra work only if we see it as a benefit for us. Well, one reason is you like to do litigation stuff. And if you don't, then you shouldn't do this. But if you do, and I found that I do, again, not as my full-time job, you can see the revealed preferences uh, in, in what my full-time job is, uh, but a little bit on the side, uh, it, it's fun. It's fun and it's rewarding and makes you feel good that you're actually involved in this. And a lot of the stuff that I do is actually tied into my scholarship, so I feel I'm kind of helping promote my scholarship this way. A second reason is that you get you, law school credit for it. So at UCLA, it's four units, the equivalent of a, of a relatively high unit uh, a substantive class. Uh, so my, my First Amendment law class is four units, four, four meets four times a week, this is four units too. And I don't think my colleagues be, begrudge me this, um, because I think it's understood that this kind of thing is, is quite labor intensive. Uh, so if you're interested in doing, uh, in doing uh, uh, this kind of litigation, uh, this is a way of freeing up time for you to do that, uh, rather than having it cut into a great deal, in, uh, cut into your, uh, your scholarship. Um, Relatedly, to the extent that you want to, to build your reputation for, uh, for purposes of taking on future paying cases or even future more interesting pro bono cases, uh, this is a good way of doing that. You could, I mean, uh, this is 12 briefs that I can credibly say I've written, to be sure it was with students, but I, I feel comfortable and honest saying that the bulk of the work in many respects was mine, whether in writing the words or in guiding the students. Uh, so, so I think that's helpful. Um, and uh, relatedly, um, uh, e it is even possible to turn some of these amicus briefs into oral arguments. Uh, amici do not customarily oral, uh, argue, uh, uh, do oral arguments, but they can. In some states, actually, all you need, in a few states, all you need is permission of somebody who's willing to share time with you. So that's, for example, I argued a, not through the clinic, but I argued a, an, uh, as a, for amici in a First Amendment case in uh, uh, Indiana Supreme Court. Indiana is one of those states. Uh, but other courts uh, will often allow you to do that on motion. Uh, and uh, the coin of the realm, apparently, in the appellate field is oral arguments. It's, it's, it's not sound, I think, to evaluate somebody based on the number of oral arguments they've had, but that seems to be so. So for various consulting purposes, I'm part, part, part time affiliated with the Mayor Brown firm, so I, so, uh, I do some appellate stuff through that. I think it's helpful for your professional development, as it were. Um, so that's why it's good for students, good for you. It's good for your school. Uh, it's costly in some measure for your school uh, because it's four units that they spend teaching, uh, they have you teach 12 students rather than have you teach 75 students. Uh, but again, it's a mix. If you were to tell your dean, all I want to do is do three copies of this a year or two copies of this a year, and I'm not going to teach you any more large cases, the dean will say, well, I'm not sure about that. But my sense is that my school is pretty happy that, uh, uh, that uh, I'm doing this as part of my uh, mix. Uh, uh, my school values clinical education, I think, more than some, but I think most schools, the idea of the scholar-practitioner, who really is serious about both, and effective and successful at both, I think is very appealing. It's appealing to the administration, because it, it's a good sell to students and a good sell to alumni, all of whom assume we're ivory tower people, and in many respects, we love the ivory tower. But if we do a little bit of both, I think that makes us more valuable to the school. And I've certainly not felt any pushback. I've felt only really enthusiasm, at least apparent enthusiasm, from the school. The last two groups uh, uh, that it helps is, first of all, it helps people on our side of the movement, which I think is right to do because I think it's the correct side of the movement. So for example, if you look at combination of the groups we've represented, the groups whose briefs we've supported, and the groups whom we supported when they were parties, it's been the Alliance Defending Freedom, 
Beckett Fund, Cato, Institute for Justice, uh, Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, um, uh, a blogger who's being sued, a conservative uh, uh, DA uh, who's, who's blogging in California named uh, Patrick Frey, who blogs under Patrico, uh, Powerline, Instafundit. Uh, uh, so I think these are people who's, who I think it, whom I think it's good to support and good to represent. And there have also been the ACLU of Missouri, Student Press Law Center, we're certainly not trying to only do things that support <laughs> groups that I particularly like. But as it happens, since I think that they have the right views and I think I have the right views, well, it turns out that most of the stuff we do is helpful to them. Nothing wrong with that. And I think it's good. I think it's, it's, it's good to have that. And finally, I think it helps judges. Uh, I think there are a lot of situations out there where the lawyering from the parties is not great. Now, that's not always so. I remember reading the uh, uh, cert petition from the Alliance Defending Freedom uh, when we were filing the supporting brief. I said, wow. This Rats, this is a really good cert petition. Makes it harder for us to say anything original. But we found it, we found it. So, uh, so uh, uh, even there, there's something to, uh, good uh, to be done, especially, I think, when we're talking about uh, uh, a discretionary review. I think the presence of amici is often a powerful signal. And especially if you're not talking about US Supreme Court, but state Supreme Court and the like. Uh, uh, but uh, beyond that, there are some of the briefs where I feel we're the ones who presented the really solid First Amendment arguments. And I think judges ought to appreciate it. And my sense is they generally do. So I think this worked very well for me. I hope to do it again next fall. And I don't see any reason why I wouldn't. Uh, I think it could work well for you. And I think through you, it could work well for the movement and for the legal system uh, more broadly. Again, I could see this being done for Fourth Amendment stuff. I could see it being done for separation of power stuff. Although one problem, of course, you need to make sure there are enough cases that you can confident, be confident you can populate the docket of the school. Uh, you can, might be able to do it for Second Amendment stuff, although, again, there may be something of a case number and diversity problem there. Certainly bankruptcy, various private law fields should be huge opportunities uh, for doing that. So I think it's worked well, very well for me, and I hope you guys adopt some of this too. Randy. Thank you, Gene. Uh, two questions, though. First, um, what is the classroom component of your course, if any? And secondly, do the, the, the students' names go on the brief? Uh, so uh, excellent questions. The classroom component is basically we meet uh, once a week in groups of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in, in our entire group. And some of it is, that, for example, there's an editing workshop where we go through, uh, go through actually a paper, but the next time it will be a brief, uh, uh, and I'll show them how to edit, because the key to good writing is editing. Um, uh, but we also kind of have a little follow-up on what are you doing on, on each of the cases you're doing. I think it's in part for team building, for have, having them feel that they're working together in a, in a group. Uh, but partly because I think conversations with each group help give ideas to other groups, even as to other briefs. Relatedly, what happens is I meet with each three students, uh, each group of three students who are working on the brief, to edit the brief. And what I do is I set it up a two to three hour session where we are in a, a room, uh, there is the in-room computer is being used to display the brief, and I sit there and I edit it, and I narrate the editing. This is an idea I got from, uh, uh, from another clinical professor, and I think it's worked very well. My sense is the students love it. I was afraid they would feel self-conscious, because here I am ripping apart their prose. Uh, I think they really appreciate it, because they, if you just give them the mark, the marked up copy, they'll enter the edits, but I'm not sure they'll understand why the edits are there, even if I tell them to think hard about it. Uh, but with this, my, they tell me that it's very useful, and my sense is that it's, it's useful. So that's the classroom component. Students' names going on the brief. The first eight, I didn't put them on. Uh, and then, in part because of a comment on a blog post that I, that I wrote about this, I thought, you know, maybe I should try harder. And it turns out that even, say, U, U.S. Attorney's Office, sometimes just at the bottom of the front page, say, thank you to students so-and-so. And I checked with, uh, uh, with a couple of people I know about this, a couple of judges mm -hmm. I know, and uh, they said, you know, that should probably be fine. And one of them said, actually, it's, it's nice. It, shows, it makes you look gracious on the very front cover of the page, Which, even though the problem is I'm not sure that the rules specifically authorize mm -hmm. that. Some courts provide that you can actually put the names of students uh, as counsel, although not members of the bar, not counsel of record, complicated thing is that those rules apply equally to people actually representing parties in oral argument as they do to students just co-signing amicus briefs. Uh, so they're often quite fairly burdensome. You have the students had to be third year students. They have to have taken evidence and professional responsibility and this and that. So I never went through those procedures. But it's possible to do that. 
Uh, and I do think it would be it's something the students would really appreciate. And I'm looking for other ways of doing that. Maybe even if you can't put it on the cover, they would put it in a footnote, a first footnote to the brief. And again, judges looking at that will probably say, at least so I'm told, this is a nice thing for you to be doing. Well, thanks. This is a great idea. This panel was uh, Eugene's idea, and uh, I got added as um, um, a second person to be on the panel um, I, uh, who has some litigation experience. Uh, so I thought I would talk a little bit about mine and, and why, I've, uh, uh, why I think it's a good thing to do. Uh, I, as Jean, Eugene gave some autobiographical background, I'll do the same. I went to law school uh, solely to become a criminal trial lawyer, I had no desire to be any other thing than that. Um, and uh, became a criminal trial lawyer in the Cook County State's Attorney's Office, tried cases to juries, uh, which is what I always aspire to do from, based on a television show called The Defenders I mentioned yesterday during the IP uh, session, and, uh, which was set here on location in New York. And so um, uh, I, when I, after, after I graduated, after I became a law professor, if it had to think about, after a while, I, you stop thinking about yourself as a practicing lawyer, you start thinking about yourself solely as an academic, but I, if I had forced to consider think of myself as a practicing lawyer, I would think of myself as a trial lawyer, and I have a certain pride in that as compared to my colleagues who wouldn't know how to try a case. So it was a sort of a, a badge of honor for me. Um, uh, I, I didn't know anything about appellate work. I've never been a law clerk. Uh, I've never, I'd never seen an appellate court argument. Um, and, uh, and so this was completely uh, uh, foreign to me. So how did I get sucked into this? And that was, um, through my scholarship on the Ninth Amendment, uh, Justice uh, Breyer's brother, Charles Breyer, who's a district court judge in California, was one of the uh, judges in the uh, Oakland Cannabis Buyers Cooperative case on the medical marijuana issue, and he told the parties that uh, they, he wanted them to brief the Ninth Amendment uh, in the trial court. Um, and they went around the country trying to find somebody who knew something about the Ninth Amendment. Uh, there aren't that many people who do. It was my area of specialty. I was at Boston University at the time. I remember getting the phone call from this lawyer in California. Normally when I got calls like this, since I didn't do any consulting, I was, not only did I not do any consulting, I was opposed to law professors who did do consulting. I no longer feel that way uh, about other law professors. I still don't consult, really. Uh, but I don't, no longer feel judgmental about those who do. Um, uh, the, anyway, I got this call. I usually just completely, I just blow off whoever calls me. But and he's telling me about this case. I, I didn't know anything about it, and he's about the Ninth Amendment. And, and it turned out, I mean, I could hear that it was, it was a federal case. It was a Ninth Amendment case. Usually they'd be state cases, and they wouldn't be. So it was like, it was correct. I mean, it could have been a Ninth Amendment case. And so I said I would help out. And uh, so I wrote a few pages of their trial court brief. Morrison and Forster was the law firm primarily doing the heavy lifting. The guy that approached me was a guy named Robert Rach, who was a local lawyer, very active in the cannabis movement. Um, and uh, who ultimately married Angel McClary, became Angel McClary Rach, and that was sort of the, where the Rach case came from. But um, at any rate, I did this thing, and uh, kind of one thing led to another. It was a Commerce Clause challenge. It wasn't a Ninth Amendment challenge, um, uh, but I just did this. But I got to know them. I got to know Morrison Forster, the people that were working on the case, and I got involved in the Commerce Clause aspect of it, started doing more work on their briefs with them. Um, I remember I was in Northern California being driven around by Rob, uh, giving a talk, I think, at the Independent Institute or something, and he said to me, are you a member of the Supreme Court Bar? And I s said, um, uh, no. And he said, well, you should join the Supreme Court Bar. I said, why? He said, because this case, meaning the OCBC case, was going to go to the Supreme Court. It actually did go to the Supreme Court. Um, and uh, I said, come on, Rob, the case isn't going to go to the Supreme Court. Cases don't just go to the Supreme Court. Uh, and he says, yeah, it's going to go to the Supreme Court, and you're going to argue it. I said, I'm not going to argue. I've never even done that. I mean, I'm not going to do that. He goes, you should join the Supreme Court Bar. I said, okay, I humored him. I joined the Supreme Court Bar. So um, that's how I kind of got started. The case did go to the Supreme Court. Uh, the, he and the client really wanted me to argue it. Uh, Morrison and Forster were greatly, strongly, unbelievably opposed to me doing it. Um, and um, um, yeah, actually went and investigated me and everything to try to undercut my ability to do it. It was actually the right decision not to, for me not to do it. Uh, I got a little bit, I got my back up a little bit when they went after me so hard, um, but I didn't necessarily think they were wrong and ultimately, I mean, and so the, ultimately I went to the Supreme Court argument, the, one of the first I'd ever seen when um, Jerry Ullman, who's a professor at Santa Clara, argued the case and was my co, one of the, also working on the case all along and he, he just got his head handed to him in this oral argument. It was an eight to nothing decision against us and the only reason it wasn't nine to nothing is Justice Breyer had to recuse himself because his brother was the trial judge. And so, so, uh, 
I was so grateful I was not up there because <laughs> there was no way I would have done any better than he was. It got it head handed to him, not because of any failure of advocacy, but because our position was so so subject to being criticized. So I was really, really grateful. But, you know, it was interesting. I got to be there in the court and listen to it. So anyway, the Rach case came about because we needed a case that had better facts than the, than the OCBC case had. And so Angel and, and Diane Monson became our clients for that purpose. And I became much more of a, a leading force in that case, still working with, uh, I guess it wasn't at that point, no Morrison enforcer. It was just me and these other two guys. Uh, so I did a lot more of the brief writing at that point. And then ultimately, when we finally went to the Supreme Court after we got through the Ninth Circuit and we won in the Ninth Circuit, um, then um, um, Kirkland, not Kirkland, no, I just, uh, just drawn a blank on the, on, the, on, the wonderful, on the firm that I work with, which is an important part. The fact that I work with firms is an important part of the story. Um, it'll come to me. Um, uh, anyway, they did, they did that. All right, so anyway, that's what, how I got into it. Why is it a good thing? Why, I've learned it was a good thing to do. And uh, it's not something I seek out. Unlike Eugene, I don't enjoy it that much. Um, I don't do it because it's fun. Um, I do it because I think it's useful. And I think I have value added. And it makes me feel like I've, sat, I've accomplished something that I want to. Um, but not because I relish it that much. I, if I never appear in court again as an advocate, I, I won't, won't bother me a bit. Um, uh, so, um, but why do I think you should think about doing it? How has it benefited me and uh, others? Um, primarily, I think of myself as a scholar. I want, I, that's, that's my main thing. That's what I think I can do better than other people. There are better lawyers out there than I am, um, uh, better appellate court lawyers than I am, and there's no reason why I should be competing with them when that's what they can do best, where I can write articles and books and develop legal theories that they can't, and that's why I should be doing that. My highest value is very, a very natural law Aristotelian guy. Uh, that's what I should be doing. However, in this case, um, it turns out what I learned is several things. First of all, I learned that we as academics, if we can think like lawyers, and I frankly, that my prosecution background turned out to be extremely valuable in allowing me to think like a tactical, to think tactically like a lawyer, um, and, so, and even better than some of these appellate lawyers sometimes can. Um, uh, we actually add, bring value to these cases. We, we can, we know, we think about things at a different level than practicing lawyers do, uh, even high level ones. And uh, we can do overview stuff, we can see theoretical problems, we can see pr imbalances in arguments between this part and that part, and tensions and stuff, and w w which they're going to get in trouble if they make these arguments, whereas they're just st lots of times just putting arguments together one after the other without thinking about it. So we can do good work, we can bring value. Uh, to these cases, whether we are representing parties or whether we are doing amicus briefs. I have to say most of what I do is amicus briefs myself. I'm going to tell a little bit about how I do it, uh, which makes it easier for you to contemplate doing it. Um, uh, but we can bring value uh, to that. Now, the other thing that I think is really important that I learned, and that is, and this is, should seem obvious once it's said, but I didn't really think about it, it really <coughs> has informed my scholarship and really has informed my teaching. I'm a much better teacher about the subject, I, because the stuff I always do is related to what I teach. Uh, it's not separate from what I teach. I'm much better in the classroom talking about this stuff because I've done this litigation aspect. I put these ideas to work, um, and the students like it, but just not because they like it. I don't care, but that's because it actually, I bring value, and they, there's something for them that, to you know, properly like uh, in that. So that, and it has my scholarship. It makes me think my ideas through more, trying to, because it, it meets contact with the enemy, which is the other side, and they're going to, you know, argue against it. And then, well, wait a second, what is the, what is now? What, what now? What do I do? So it really, the adversary system really does make you produce better work and think harder about your stuff. So it's very valuable to my scholarship. My scholarship has been greatly improved uh, by the work I've done in court. And so then, how do I do it? Um, uh, it I, other people can do this differently. It's just a matter of me, how I do it. I don't recommend that you have to do it this way. I typically don't write these things myself. Um, I, typ I typically function, I don't know anything about law firms, frankly. I'm learning about law. I learned about law firms by doing this and working with them. Otherwise, I never even interned with one, so I didn't know how they actually operated. But um, uh, I work more like a partner in a firm than an associate. That is, somebody else does the first drafts of pretty much everything I do. Um, and then I edit it. And I. Like Eugene's editing his students, I'm editing associate's work, or maybe a partner's work. And so um, when I do a brief with the Institute for Justice, for example, I work with one of their lawyers. When I do a brief, many briefs for the Cato Institute, I work with Trevor Burris and Ilya Shapiro, and, and Trevor or someone else like Trevor does the first draft, and I come in, I sometimes totally redo it. 
uh, but I don't actually have to sit there and generate the first sentence on a page and figure out where we go from there. I did do that in the Rach case in the early times, but that was pretty much the only time I've done that. And mostly I've worked with firms. And then when I work with firms, uh, for one reason or another, a firm might come and recruit me uh, to do an amicus brief on something uh, that, I, that I believe in, which I'm going to get to in a second. Um, I'll work with uh, the firms. I'll work with their associates. What I learned from this process was, boy, associates can be really smart, and they can do amazing work. I can't believe these people just were law students three or four years earlier, and now they're producing this stuff that I don't think I could do. And so it's very rewarding to do that, uh, yet I think there's value to be added. All right, so um, I wanted to, to save some of this just time for Q&A about how you do it, but let me just give you, there's one important tip I just will feel remiss if I don't say this, and that is that if you do anything like what I'm doing, I'm not sure this applies to Eugene, I think it might, but I, it certainly applies to me, you've got to become a member of the bar, an active member of the bar of your jurisdiction. Um, I think law professors forget about this, and some have gotten themselves into trouble. Um, and the bar is not, it, the people who run the bar are not really sweet and understanding and compassionate people who just say, oh yeah, you're just an innocent law professor, you just slipped up. Um, it may very well be because the positions you take, they want to actually go after you, make an example of you. Just become a member of the bar, uh, but you really need to do that. So if you can't do that for some reason, don't want to do that for some reason, then I would advise not practicing law without a license. That's my, <laughs> that's my number one piece of advice for you. Um, so um, I guess, do I have anything else to say? I, I probably have lots of other things to say, but um, uh, it's been very rewarding. And for the, I mean, I basically agree with all the reasons Eugene said about why it's a good thing to do. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's, it turned out to have brought some extra visibility to me, uh, it, which has feed, fed back into my academic career um, and uh, has helped me, it's raised my profile and has helped me professionally. And I think it helped me, for, I, for example, I really think it helped me get the job at Georgetown, frankly. Uh, from BU, which is where I was. Um, I tried really hard to move out of BU unsuccessfully. Doing lateral moves are very, very difficult. I had just been uh, bitterly disappointed by a job at another elite law school where the faculty unanimously voted me an offer to, of employment and the dean refused to make the offer to me and so I was really kind of crushed by this. Um, but, um, uh, and one of the arguments the dean made, by the way, for why I shouldn't get, why he was not supporting the faculty's decision was he said my move from contract law to con law was, came too late in my career to be uh, effective. Oh, so um, he didn't think I was really had a future as a con law person. Um, <laughs> so this is an elite law school, I have to tell you. There's one that you might have, you'd not, you'll know the name of. So um, anyway, uh, um, but because I argued in the Supreme Court this Rach case, um, the, the people at Georgetown, I, I both I argued the Rach case and my book, Restoring the Lost Constitution, basically came out in the same year. So I had both this academic thing and I had this high profile uh, Supreme Court case. Um, um, and uh, as a result, I think that's how I got over the hump at Georgetown when there's all these veto gates that are there to prevent people like us from getting in. They had, they had you know, reasons for wanting me, but it, even if some people want you, there's other people who go, well, what about this and what about that? But having performed at this level, it met the Georgetown profile and standard. It was somebody they wanted there. And ever since then, they've been extremely grateful to have me there when I did the work on the health care case. Even though they were all 100% against me, um, they really were happy that I was there, proud of me. Um, it enhanced my stature with my colleagues as well as outside the law school. It enhanced the stature of the law school, helped the students. Uh, anyway, so it's, ter it's turned out to be very good for me professionally. But the la I guess the one thing I do have down here to say, and, and that is that when you do this thing, uh, and doing amicus is really easier to do this, you just cannot compromise your principles. Um, if you represent a, lawyer, a party, you have to make every reasonable argument on behalf of your party, whether you really believe it or not, which is an argument why you shouldn't necessarily represent parties, unless it's like the Rage case or the NFAB case, where it just so happens that your party's interest is entirely the same as your view of the subject. I mean, there's just no difference. There's no daylight between my party's position and my position. In fact, one of the reasons I was able to keep the oral argument in the Rage case is because I asked the other, the counsel from the law firm who, maybe it's a good thing now, I haven't remembered the name of it, uh, who tried to take the argument away from me by appealing to the client, saying he should do it because he'd done it before and I'd never done it before. Um, I, I had a private, he had a private conversation where he tried to talk me out, I mean, this is being videotaped, it's all right. Um, he tried to talk me out of it and I said to this lawyer, um, well, you know, I don't even know if you agree, if I don't even know if you believe in the position we're arguing, do you? And, uh, and, I, and, he, and there's this long silence on the phone. He said, well, you know, I'd have to think about it. 
So uh, actually, um, that helped me with the client, let's put it that way. Uh, and I think it helps to believe in your, so I, there, there was a client, it happened to be uh, exactly my own position, which is good, but normally that isn't going to be the case. You'll make all kinds of, I was just talking to Paul Clement about originalism in, in, privately, and he said, look, you know, I'll make every argument for my client that I should make. I, if it's not, if my client's interest is not originalist, then that's my duty as a lawyer to make the best argument. He's absolutely right about that. And so uh, you have to, so that's why writing amicus briefs are great, because amicus briefs is when you bring your perspective to the court for what it's worth, you don't, you're not responsible for the client's well-being, and you are just there to help the court out with the position you think is right. And oftentimes, as you know from reading these judicial opinions, and they're not always cited in the judicial opinions, they have a big impact. They can have a big impact on how judges write their opinions, the right amicus brief. And we've had a big, I've had a, we, meaning the people I've wrote these briefs with, have had big impacts on cases like Lawrence v. Texas and um, lots of cases that have happened recently uh, where I see the court picking up on our arguments even where they don't cite us and sometimes they cite us for some trivial point, uh, sort of a thank you, without citing us for the main point that they're taking from our brief and that making their own. So it's very useful. Anyway, I, said, I thought I didn't have anything to say. I guess I had a few things to say. And now we can talk about it. Yes, Steve? This webcast, Steve, so we need to use the mic. Um, in hearing Eugene talk about working with students on amicus briefs, I was reminded of uh, the fact that I started about 10 years ago asking my introductory constitutional law students to write a 10-page paper as well as take a final exam. And the paper assignment is to pick a case in constitutional law where they think the majority opinion was poorly written or incorrect write a majority opinion, and then write a dissent from their own majority opinion. Wow. And the students really, really like that. They really get into it. They often realize the case is closer than they thought it was because they have to write a dissent to their own majority opinion. And the papers tend to be fun to use. So I just met pass along as a su suggestion on teaching <coughs> advocacy skills generally in law school. That sounds excellent. So um, I have to comment quickly first. I find it amusing that you both think you have to persuade us on this because if I'm, I can't be the only prof in the room. If I don't start teaching a skills course upper level soon, I'm going to be looking for a job, um, tenure or not. That's the new reality. And electives, you know, the old doctrinal elective is, is dying. Um, so I'm very excited about that. But I wondered if, if Eugene, you could talk just a bit about case selection and timing in sync with yeah. the 15 week semester and so on? Yep, absolutely. Uh, so this, so um, what happens is during the summer, I find cases for the fall, for the fall class. And uh, I have Westcliff queries running. Uh, and they found for me probably of the 12 cases, I found maybe 10 during the summer. And that was enough to make me feel confident that I'd have no trouble with the 12th. I also sent out feelers to various, uh, various groups uh, and some discussion lists and such, and I got maybe one case through that. A couple of the cases fell through. They will, and you need to warn the students. There was one really cool case, which we're going to file, which we actually started work on, and then it settled. You know, what are you going to do? But I found no problem through the same Westcliff queries uh, to, uh, finding uh, some other cases. So ultimately, we filled our 12, uh, uh, 12 case docket. One of the cases came as a request from a lawyer friend of mine, uh, and another case came as a mix of my finding it, and then it turned out there was a connected case that was a request for somebody to whom I owed a favor from a previous amicus brief. So that's actually one advantage of this, is you can pay back some of the favors you owe, which you end up having if you're, in doing, amicus, if you're doing both amicus and party work. Sometimes as a party, you need to drum up amicus support, and somebody's got to, has got to do it. So you can pay them back this way. So in any event, for, through a mix of these things, but overwhelmingly through my own Westcliff's queries, I found the cases, and I'm now at a point where for next year I won't 
for a moment worry about whether I'll find the cases. They are out there. And there are cases that I decided not to, to get involved in because I thought they weren't quite as good. Uh, I think uh, uh, you might, uh, uh, might want to be a little bit more worried if you are in a field where the cases are somewhat less common. So for example, federal separation of powers, my guess is, it's just not as many cases that come up as, uh, as, as First Amendment cases. And then again, in other areas, the problem is actually winnowing through the cases, writing the right query that will find you a manageable number of cases uh, uh, every day to, 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 to quickly skim. Uh, but this is actually something that takes a non-trivial amount of work. It's interesting work because it also helps me keep track of what's happening in lower courts and helps inform my scholarship in that, in, in that respect. It's something I would have done in any case. I'd had these queries running for years and found a lot of interesting cases uh, that way. But yeah, that's something you need to think about doing and you need to do during the summer. You might actually end up uh, uh, enlisting uh, uh, help of some research librarians uh, for this, especially if you, you trust them and have a good relationship with them. They're often very happy to do that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, uh, if you do want to do this, you want to fiddle with some West Loop queries, have them running for a few months, see if they find the cases that, that, that you want to find. The alternative, of course, is to have really good feelers out to a lot of groups out there. And in certain areas, that might be helpful. But I actually tried to get in touch with the ACLU, with uh, uh, IJ with various other groups. Actually, I guess one of the cases I got because I talked to people at Institute for Justice. Center for Individual Rights is also an excellent uh, organization that does uh, some First Amendment stuff, some uh, race preferences stuff. Uh, I didn't get anything from them this time, but I might uh, in, in the future. So it's possible to do it this way, but generally speaking, I think it's Westlaw and Lexis queries. If you can figure out the new Lexis, which I can't. Oh, the timing, yeah, you find them. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. So one you're going to have to get a sense of is what the uh, briefing schedules end up looking like in various places. So for example, one thing that I found is that a few cases, district court cases that came out in the spring, I thought it would be perfect for the fall, turned out the briefing schedule in some circuits is actually very quick. In other circuits, such as the Ninth Circuit, the briefing schedule is quite slow. Uh, so, uh, so you will get a sense, both at the state and the federal level, what the briefing schedules are, because the way that you find them, of course, when I say West Loop queries, it's the lower court decision that you're going to find the West Loop query on. Uh, th then, you, then what you do is you, uh, you have a sense, oh, well, it's a spring case from the Ninth Circuit, great for the fall. Spring case from the Fifth Circuit, not so good, although maybe you'll call uh, uh, the lawyer and see if, there's good, if they're asking for an extension or some such. The other thing to keep in mind is that if you're supporting the appellant or the petitioner, the top side, the first brief, uh, then uh, you, uh, you've got a one schedule. If you're supporting the respondent uh, or the appellee, you've got another schedule. And that also depends on whether you think it matters what the other side is saying. So if you want to support the appellee, you might have a relatively narrow window between the time your brief is due and the time the appellant's brief is due, if you really need to read the appellant's brief. Uh, but on the other hand, in some situations, you know what the appellant's going to say because there's only one thing they could be saying. And at that point, you actually have a pretty long window to deal with. And finally, there are a lot of briefs for which our class deadline proved to be long before the filing deadline. But that's fine. You could say, okay, we have to have the case in the, in the can by November 30th. One other thing, actually, I should mention since you brought this up, what I ended up having is three uh, groups of cases, the September cases, the October cases, the November cases, which roughly speaking were due September 30th, October 30th, 1st, and November 30th, uh, at least for, for the students. And there was a little bit of juggling that had to be done. For example, one case ended up uh, uh, getting, uh, the briefing schedule got changed by a month, which meant we could have still f uh, uh, did, uh, filed uh, in, uh, in September, but it gave me the opportunity to pick up a, a, a case that otherwise, that was kind of a, a, um, uh, a waiting list case, as it were, for September. So you have to be nimble in dealing with these things, and you have to develop a sense for what the timing ends up being in various courts, uh, which cases are likely to, uh, to get extensions, which are not. Uh, but it's something you do pretty quickly, and I think the students sometimes appreciate some of that. One of the thing, other things that I think uh, I, that I didn't mention about what the students like, I think the students like the fact they've got to sit and read the rules and figure out what the deadlines are and figure out what the word counts are and what the formatting is because it's a different kind of skill. It's the, f the tenth time you do it, it's no fun. First time you do it, it's actually fun. Or... <laughs>
<coughs> Art Wilmarth from GW. So I've done several amicus briefs in banking law, law cases, and I would say two things that I think it's helped me with. One is that I think as law professors, we, we, we often fall into the problem of writing like Faulkner. And then when you write briefs, you, have to, you, you figure out we have to write like Hemingway. And then ho hopefully what you end up with is, as a scholar, writing more like Fitzgerald. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, you know, the discipline of, of writing really concisely and, and not all the, the padding and filler, I found to be really helpful for my scholarly writing. The second thing I found is that, it, it, as you say, it gives you visibility. One way that it helps and give you visibility, it, it tends to get you opportunities to testify before Congress. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think congressional testimony is another wonderful way both to share your scholarship, share your views, but it's also an advocacy experience. And I think if you do the amicus briefs, uh, maybe do some oral arguments, you're going to be much better in front of Congress than yeah. you would be otherwise. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I think that the, those are both excellent points. As to the first, I think it's tremendously important, but it's also, I mean, if, if we have a tendency to write in a verbose way, boy, the students have it in spades, and they just totally bury the lead. Uh, the, that the thing that it surprised me most, actually, is how hard it is for them to grasp simply that there is a main point to this brief, and it should be in the first paragraph, preferably in the first sentence. It, you laugh because it seems so obvious. Well, it is obvious, and in fact, it probably is obvious to them, too, once you tell them. But even after you tell them, they don't actually do a good job of it. And this experience of sitting there with me saying, look, there's a good point here, or there's a good point, there's a good opening sentence here, it's just in paragraph seven. And if we move it up here, and if we arrange this, look how much more forceful it ends up being. Uh, I think it's just tremendously useful experience for them, because the fact is, they haven't written virtually anything. We've at least written law review articles. They're not often optimal, they're, they're not the, uh, the same as briefs, but at least we have experience with that they don't. We shouldn't expect them to be good at it until we teach them, and this is our way of teaching them. Uh, just one little teeny thing I just wanted, because it's like slightly off topic, but Eugene will appreciate it, and that is that I don't think I was able to write concisely and, and correctly b best until I became a blogger. So blogging actually helped. I, I was never able to place an op-ed, for example, because I couldn't write properly for an op-ed until I became a blogger and I, I got a new voice. It's a voice that's pretty consistent with my academic voice, but it's much more concise and pithy. And I think that also fed back into brief writing. And it, so it's, it's all a, a piece, but blogging fits this as well. Uh, Eugene and Randy, um, and uh, um, we will uh, take a, a two-minute break um, and uh, then move on to our 930 panel.